going to read um, Zechariah and uh, from chapter three of Zechariah. I'm not going to read uh, many verses. Actually, if you've got a church Bible, it's page 670 will be a good one to aim for, uh, because that will take you right to the very verses we need if it's a church Bible. Tell you what, I'm going to run and get some water. <laughs> Found Zechariah, giving you plenty of opportunity to do so. <laughs> Chapter three. And I'm just going to read from verse six. Two verses I'm going to read from verse 6 of chapter 3 of Zechariah. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and will have charge of my courts. I will give you a place among those standing here. Sorry, I've read the wrong two verses, but there we are. Verse eight, listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates, associates seated, be seated before you. You are men symbolic of things to come. Who are men symbolic of things to come? I am going to bring my servant, the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone. And I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. So the two verses we should have read, and really it's just one verse and one uh, short sentence in that verse, verse nine. Sorry, verse, <laughs> verse eight, I can't see. I am going to bring my servant the branch. It's at the end of verse eight. I'm going to bring my servant the branch get it right Danny. so let me start clear my mind are you ready for christmas that is something that is often said around the shops uh, this time of year and when people perhaps work colleagues and so forth before they say their goodbyes and go home for christmas are you ready for christmas are you all set and uh, today being christmas eve Perhaps there's people out now doing their last shop. Maybe there are some people who haven't got any shopping yet, any presents yet, and they're going round in a mad dash trying to buy and get things. I suppose you can get some last minute bargains in that way. But are you ready for Christmas? When you put that to people and they show the armful of stuff they've got and 500 mince pies and all sorts of other things, all this for one day, all this for one day. Christmas Eve, today where the traveller will arrive home from travelling around, maybe in work or whatever. They'll arrive later on in the day. The trains will stop. The roads will empty. And then by this evening, you might say, the nation's set. The nation's all ready for Christmas Day. The nation can't wait for Christmas Day. And the excitement will abound in many houses. You know how we had a, a child who, when they were young, actually went to bed at Christmas, on Christmas Eve and all we suddenly could hear was screaming coming from the bedroom. What's going on? I'm so excited. I can't keep it in. And so this child was screaming on Christmas Eve, the nation screaming for Christmas Day, full of excitement. But let me put to you, that if we think about a day, that day, Christmas Day, the coming of Christ, as I've said already, the Old Testament is the book of preparation. The Old Testament is the book that is there to get us ready if we would read it and by the Spirit understand it, to prepare our hearts to receive him, to prepare us for Christmas Day, as it were, to prepare us for that day. And those living at the time of the Old Testament, when it was being written, as they understood these things, had a longing, a longing for Christmas Day itself, a longing for the birth of Messiah, a longing for God to fulfill his promise, that promise that was first given to Adam and his wife Eve 
in the garden, remember? And because it was given to them who are the father, mother and father of all humankind, a promise given to all the world. A seed, a seed who would come, a son who would come, who will crush. The Bible says, he shall crush your head. The first promise of a saviour. Right there at the beginning, Genesis 3.15. That promise, as you read through this book of preparation, the Old Testament, it continues with Abraham. Abraham was told that all people on earth will be blessed through you, through your son, through the seed that will come from your line, son from Abraham. It goes on, that promise to Isaac, to Judah. Judah himself foresaw and gave this, made this wonderful declaration. The seed, the Messiah, would come from Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, till he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations. All nations will be blessed through you. The obedience of the nations is his. To Judah, from Judah would come that seed. And then from Judah, what does David tell us? What is told through David? David, you can read it in 2 Samuel 7, but let me give you it from uh, 2, uh, 1 Chronicles 17. I will set him, says the Lord to David, a son. I will set him over my house and my kingdom. His throne will be established forever. And so you read through the Old Testament and you see this first promise of a Messiah, a saviour. Then you see it, you can trace it right through, you can trace it through Noah and those I've left all them out, but you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David. And as you read through the Old Testament, you see so many. We read one from Zechariah 10, verse 4 earlier, the cornerstone and so forth, the tent peg, all these promises, all there, many of them, many of them, all pointing to a saviour. Perhaps we can think of uh, Moses, because although Moses was a different tribe to Judah, of Moses, it was said through Moses, the Lord said, I will raise up a prophet like you from amongst your people. And then you get to the end of Moses' life, the end of Deuteronomy chapter 34, and you read there, since Moses, no prophet has risen in Israel, like him, whom the, new, the, the Lord knew face to face. So the Lord had promised a prophet like Moses, but you get to the end of Deuteronomy and the writer looking back says, well, he hasn't come yet. He hasn't come yet, the prophet like Moses. And indeed, you get to the whole, to the end of the Old Testament, and he still hasn't come. But there's been so many texts, so many passages of scripture, so many prophets raised up. Zechariah, probably foremost amongst them, for giving great prophecies, adding to the dossier, adding to the information, the facts that God has set down to tell us. He's coming. He's coming. Messiah is coming. So you get to the end of the Old Testament. And if you read it right, you can only have but a longing in your heart. Oh, when will he arrive? When will he come? The Old Testament, read it. Look for Christ in it. It's a book of preparation. Preparation for his arrival. Preparation for that day, which I'm going to call Christmas Day. The first Christmas Day. Let, me consider, let us consider this. First of all, the one who will write the fall. The one who will write the fall. You know what the fall was, don't you? On that day, that day, that fateful day, 
Adam lost it all together with his wife. He lost it all. But one is coming on the day, that day. One is coming who will win. And if Adam lost it all, the one coming, the Christ, will win it all back and some, and some more. You see, the devil on that fateful, dreadful day at the beginning in the garden there, the devil took us all into misery, into sin and into death. And he reigned in the heart of humankind. But the seed, Genesis 3.15, he shall crush your head. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, the devil. He shall crush your head. The seed on that day will crush the head of the serpent, destroying his power, lifting us out of sin and death and taking over the reign of our hearts, reigning us, reigning us, Lord Jesus. The one who will right the fall. Just consider this. What shall he be like? Who shall it be? Well, he must come as a servant. He must be a servant. He must serve both God and us, both God and man. Must serve God in doing all that God requires. Come willingly, obedient to his father. He must serve God. And he must serve us because we can't serve ourselves because we're lost in trespasses and sins. So he who comes must be a servant. But he also must be man. He must be man to atone, to put right what Adam got so wrong, to put right the fall and raise us up to life. You see, and the New Testament tells us this very clearly. Bulls, sheep, goats, pigeons, even anything, whatever you want to offer, they're unacceptable as a means of winning us back. They're unacceptable as a sacrifice. It's man who sinned, and man must put it right. So the one to come must be man. Now think of this must be a servant, must be man. All of these, take these two titles, servant, man. There's a sermon there on the servant, the suffering servant. Must be man. There's more than a sermon there on that, isn't there? But what else must he be? The one who is to come. He must be king. He must be king. A king to conquer the devil and take away his rule in the heart of man. And a king to rule in our hearts so that such a thing as a fall never happens again. Must be servant, must be man, must be king. But then he must be God. Why must he be God? <laughs> because no mere man can do all this. No mere man can do all this. You see, the offence that Adam committed, and don't forget, every one of us, when we live our lives, we heap sin upon sin, but the offence of Adam was an offence against an infinite, eternal God. And every sin that we commit is an offence against an infinite, eternal God. Therefore, therefore, the one who will right the fall must himself be infinite and eternal. He must be God. Now, I'm just giving you the headlines here of these things. All of those titles should be taken up at length. Take them up in your own heart if you've never done so before. Must be a servant. Must be man. Must be king. Must be God. But then think of this. He must also be born of us. To be one of us. He can't just be some kind of ghost. It's got to be man. We've seen that already. He must be born of us 
to be one of us. But how can he share our humanity without inheriting Adam's sin? We're born sinners. We're born inheriting Adam's sin. So before we even begin our lives, we, we've had it because we're sinners already. How can he share our humanity without inheriting Adam's sin and therefore himself being born a sinner? How can he do that yet be at the same time fully one of us? Well, must be a virgin birth. Must be a virgin birth. And that is promised in the Old Testament. The virgin will be, you know this scripture, don't you? Isaiah 7. Anyone know the verse? 14, well done. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and you shall call him Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. A son, man. God with us. But born of a virgin. Born of a virgin. Must be a virgin. And again, that is something, a subject, maybe I'll take up a little bit more tomorrow, but that is something, it's a subject in itself. Why must he be a, a born of a virgin? Because otherwise he will share in the sin of Adam. Born a sinner. And if he's not uh, fully one of us, he can't be a man. To, so it must be a, a virgin birth. So these requirements, the one who will right the fall, must be a servant, must be man to atone, must be king to conquer, must be God, because no mere man can do this, and must be born, born of a virgin. We see all these, well, aside from the virgin birth, but I've given you a, a text for that one, but the first four then, servant, man, king, God, we see all these in the title, the branch, the branch, which we read there in Zechariah chapter three, and I finally got it right, verse eight at the end there. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. Think of a branch. Picture a branch in your mind's eye. A branch, it grows, doesn't it? It's a shoot that sprouts and grows. It develops. It expands, it gets stronger, and it increases, and so forth. And in the Old Testament, you see, God promises, God promises, one who will come, who will, his kingdom will expand and grow and develop the promises of God and his kingdom. As you read through the Old Testament, they expand, they grow, they develop. And you're eagerly waiting to get to the New Testament and see, hallelujah, he's come, the king of kings. A branch grows, develops. A branch also produces fruit. In this context, the fruit of salvation. A branch provides safety from the floods beneath, as it were, for the one who rests upon the branch. And also a branch, thick branch with its leaf, provides shelter to rest under. All these are good ways of conveying, uh, using the branch to convey some of what Christ has come to do. And in Zechariah there, uh, verse 8 of chapter 3, we see, I am going to bring my servant the branch. You see, must be a servant. Christ Jesus came to serve. Now you can read through the New Testament, you can see there's so, 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 so many ways in which he served. And you can read through the Old Testament and read the prophecies of him there and speaking of him as the servant, the suffering servant, Isaiah 53 and so forth. But here with this idea of the branch, we have uh, the servant, the servant. And it says there, I will remove the sin in verse nine of this land in a single day. In a single day, that fateful day, Adam lost it all by falling into sin. And all the days since then, the many, many days since then, no one's been able to put that right. 
No one's been able to put that in. But now, now we're told in that one day, in a single day, I will remove the sin of this land, says the Lord. That day, sin will be removed. Man will be recovered. What a day. What a day. You're living in the Old Testament times. You're reading that and you're able to say, oh, what a day that will be. My sin's not in part, but the whole, they'll, they'll be removed from me. They'll be taken away. Hallelujah, what a day. He must be a servant. What else must he be? He must be a man to atone. Now, you should have, if you've got the uh, church Bible, the same page that you're on, but you might need to flip it if you don't have. Uh, chapter 6, and go to verse 12. So we've had the branch as a servant. Look at verse 12 of chapter 6. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. The man whose name is the branch. But when I read those words, here is the man. Speaking of Christ, the branch. Here is the man. Here is the man. What does that remind me of? What does it remind you of? When I say, here is the man, where, where does your mind go to? Where can you think someone else says those words? At a most dreadful time. Here is the man. Think of those snarling Jews shouting, crucify, crucify. And Pilate rings him out and says, here is the man. Here is the man. The man who came to serve. The man who came to save. The man who came to atone. He must be man to atone now there's much more you can say if you read on there it's he who built it says uh, the temple of the lord it speaks of him as being uh, the priest he'll be a priest on his throne the lord jesus christ he said destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it he wasn't speaking about an earthly temple this isn't speaking here about building an earthly temple He's speaking about his own body and just as the jews would go to the temple to worship so we come to christ himself the true temple of god to to worship and a man to atone says there of him being priest it's the priest who uh, provides the atonement isn't it? it's the priest who brings about the sacrifice christ will do that but he will be the sacrifice must be servant here is my servant the branch must be man here is the man the branch but then you need to Turn to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah 23. And I won't uh, take this up in any uh, for any time or anything like that, but just read these words. Jeremiah 23. Must be a servant. Must be man to atone. Must be king to conquer. Verse 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David, who was David? He was king. I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will live in safety. And don't forget all the promises that are given to them, are given to all of us. And this is the name by which you will be called. The Lord, our righteousness. Not only is he to be king, he's to be our righteousness. He's to be our righteousness. A righteous branch, a king, servant to serve, man to atone, king to conquer and to rule and to reign in our hearts. And then go back further in the Bible to Isaiah and chapter 4 of Isaiah. Verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. 
all who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. Who will, he will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit and judgment and a spirit of, of judgment and a spirit of fire. The Lord will create over all Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Now, think of that. Where do you remember there being in the Old Testament cloud by day, fire by night? Was it not when Israel came out of captivity? When they came out of slavery and the glory of the Lord was in the cloud and the glory of the Lord was the light. And here, the glory of the Lord, smoke by day, glow of flaming fire by night over all the glory will be a canopy. It's the Lord again, bringing his people out of captivity, out of slavery of sin. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. Do you get what's being said here? Who's the branch? Who's speak being spoken of here as the branch in this? Is it a servant? Well, he is that. Is it man? Well, he is that. Is it king? Well, he is that. But know what is being spoken of here. It's God. The branch. God himself. And if you don't see it in those words of the smoke of cloud, the the glory cloud and the glory by night and the glory by day as it were the glory of the lord and see that it was the lord leading then and that that's what he's speaking about here it's the lord leading here the branch is god if you don't see it in that which you should <laughs> but if you don't then let me just put it this way where it says in verse two in that day the branch of the lord can also be translated the shoot who is the Lord, not just of the Lord, but the shoot, the branch is the Lord. It can be translated that way. And as one writer puts it, it's speaking of, he says, a new shoot of life through the Lord that will sprout up in the apparently dead stump of David. New shoot of life coming. The apparently dead stump of life that is David. If you turn to Isaiah 11 in the first verse, we read there, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. I give you the branch. I give you your Messiah. I give you Christmas Day, the branch of God. He will produce fruit. He will bring peace and righteousness. And he brings pride and glory. All this in those verses. Pride and glory, it's in him. In him, the branch. So we have the one who will write the fall. Must be a servant. Must be man. Must be king. Must be God. Who's seen must be born of a virgin. And we see those titles, those must be's, as it were all prophesied in the branch, that one glorious uh, title, the branch, my servant, my king, the man, God. Thirdly, through the branch, that day, Christmas day, has come, has come. Familiar words, let's turn to them, let's get you working. Turn to Luke, th uh, Luke chapter 1. And verse 31, and while you find it, you know these verses, it's the birth of Jesus foretold and the angel Gabriel coming to the virgin, the virgin birth, coming to Mary and proclaiming that she's to be blessed. And in verse 31, I'm going to read from verse 31, you will be with child and will give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus. Remember, Jesus, saviour saving his people from their sins you are to give him the name jesus he'll be great and will be called the son of the most high the lord god will give him the throne of his father david can you see the elements of servant man king god in all of these give him the throne of his father david he'll reign over the house of jacob forever his kingdom will never end how will this be mary asked the angel since i'm a virgin the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then we take verse 7 from nothing is impossible with God. Then I go to verse 2 of chapter 7 and I read there. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You see, in just those verses that we've read there, it's all there. It's all there. It's all very clear. The coming servant, the man, the king, God, born of a virgin. Matthew and Luke, you know, don't you? Matthew and Luke, they, they take up the story of his coming, of his birth, of the virgin with child, giving birth to the Savior. It's said by scholarly people that the Gospel of Matthew portrays Christ as king, not the same order we got here, but they're all there. Matthew portrays Christ as king. Mark portrays him as servant. Luke as man. John as God. Now, they don't just do that individually, but that's what scholarly people deduce. They say when you look at them thematic through each of those Gospels, wow, you've got servant, you've got man, you've got king, you've got God. The branch had to be all these. And he was. Read the Old Testament. Fill your heart as you come into a new year. Make it a resolution if you've never read the Old Testament or if you haven't read it for some time to read through the Old Testament and mark out the direct prophecies of the Christ to come. Mark them out. But don't just stop there. Look for him because he's there on every page. Not direct prophecy. He's there. Even if not direct prophecy, he's there. Look for him. Look for him and rejoice as you do so. King, servant, man, God. He's all these. What is he to you? What is he to you? Is he king of your heart? Do you see him as the man who must save? Have you embraced him as one who came to serve? And do you see him and do you worship him as your God? In Isaiah 53, we have these words. You know these words very well. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Written 720 years or more, probably 750 years before all that took place. And Christ was rejected even in his capital city, his homeland, Jerusalem. Away with this man. Away with this man. Crucified. But here is the man. Crucify him. We don't want him. We reject him. And the world has been rejecting him ever since. Rejecting him. Would you reject a, a Christmas present? If someone gave you a, a Christmas present, even if it was something you didn't particularly want, you'd think, oh, you went to all that trouble for me? Oh, thank you very much. You'd be so thankful that someone has gone to that trouble. For you. But no one has gone to greater trouble than God himself to send his son into this world. What a gift. And unlike my heater on the car thingy bob that's supposed to do something with the windscreen and doesn't, this gift, this gift is a must have. You can't live without this gift. And that's a fact. No greater gift than that, is there? You cannot live without this gift. You need him more than you need water. gift of God all need. Look at the trouble that he went to when he came into this world. God made him who knew no sin 
to be sin for us, that in him we might be what? The Lord, our righteousness, the righteousness of God declared to be ours. There's a, an illustration of D-Day. I've used it before. And the last time I used it, I think I was reading it from a, actually, I think it was to do with the Christmas story. I think I read it a few weeks ago on a prayer meeting. I can't remember now. But always this D-Day illustration is given of the crucifixion, the time between the crucifixion and the second coming of Christ. And the story is of D-Day, the D-Day landings. Because of the D-Day landings, the ultimate victory over Nazi Germany was certain, but you still had to go through the process of taking them out every town in France and going through Belgium and so forth and into Germany. This is to ignore what the Russians did, by the way. It's not very good history, all this. But that's the illustration given, saying that like, because of the, because of the crucifixion, victory is certain, just like D-Day was certain victory for us because of the D-Day landings. But the ultimate victory comes when Christ returns. I've never really been happy with that. I think here's a better way to use that. Scrap what we just said. D-Day, victory certain. Here's a better way to use it. On that day, on Christmas Day, the first Christmas Day, that's D-Day as it were. That's the landing coming from heaven to earth. That's the son of God coming into this world. That's a successful landing born of a virgin. It's all come to pass. Victory, how certain, absolutely certain. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop what Christ will do because he's taken on our humanity. Hallelujah. Oh, how glorious is that? It's certain now, sealing the fate of the devil. The victory of the cross will come, will come, lifting us from sin and death. But he began, as I read it in Isaiah 53 there, a tender shoot, the one who would be the branch for all the world to perch on as it began as a tender shoot in Bethlehem. Zechariah 6, 12 told us that he would branch out from that place, branch out from Bethlehem, branch out from Jerusalem, branch out from Israel to embrace the whole world. Now he extends over all the earth said at the beginning, ah, oh, now Christmas Eve night, curtains are drawn, perhaps all the lights are flashing outside and inside and so forth, and the uh, whatever, the tea's brewing, or maybe it's something stronger that people are having, and the nation's all set. No, they're not. They're not set. They're not really set for Christmas. They're getting ready, and they're ready for the wrong things. They're ready for an empty celebration. They're like the Philistines facing the Israelites. And there's Goliath, over nine foot tall, all of him. And they're cheering. Yay, yay. But he's going to lead them to disaster. They're cheering the wrong man. They're on the side of defeat. Following Goliath leads to disaster. Following a Christmas without Christ leads to eternal disaster. Because Christ, Christ is the reason. For Christmas. In the first Christmas, John tells us he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. He came as a servant and he came to, came to his people. The one they had uh, longed for was here, but they rejected him. They weren't ready for that Christmas as it was. But John goes on to say this, to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Can that be said of you today? Are you a child of God? You're only a child of God if you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour and your Lord. You must prepare your heart. Every heart we sing, prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, is it? Heaven and nature come, I'm not sure. But every heart, prepare him room. You make room in your heart. We make room in our heart for all sorts of things. But is there room in our hearts? Have we pushed everything aside? Flung it to one side. It's worthless. 
compared to him and placed him in a center of God. That he's the one I need. He's the one I need. That day, that Christmas day, came one who was born to serve and reign as king, born of a virgin, the man who was God. Let me finish with this. Speaking of a day and that day and this day and the great day. There is one other great day to come. Well, actually two. And the one is this. It may have happened for you, but it may not. And if it hasn't, why not? Because that day for you is the day when you embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Have you done so? Is he your Savior? That becomes the greatest day for you even greater than uh, the birth of a child day or your marriage day. That day, if you experience that day. But then there is one more great day, isn't there? One more great day to come, one from which no one will be able to escape. And that is the day of his return. To be ready for that day, we must come to him in this day while there is still time. Have you prepared your heart? Are you ready for Christ this Christmas? Amen.